So thank you very much, uh, Jim. I uh, appreciate your hospitality very much and that we're able to come back to the DeGroote School of Business. I should say the Ron Joyce Center at the DeGroote School of Business again. And we'll be coming back here again in the fall, I'm sure. Uh, before I go any further, I do want to introduce a couple of my colleagues from Burlington City Council. At uh, the back there is uh, Councillor Jack Dennison from Ward 4, as well as, uh, you can give him a hand. As well as my colleague, Councillor Paul Sharman from Ward 5. I also want to thank uh, Dan Guado, the COO of Burlington Hydro, who's here with us tonight for being one of our sponsors to the event as well as Kojiko, the Burlington Post, and AV Tech for all their support of the Inspire Burlington series. But the objective of the series is to elevate the discussion in the community about the future of our city. As we all know, municipal government is not just about uh, fixing potholes and cutting grass and plowing snow. Municipal government is the closest form of government and the most important form of government to the citizens, as we are the most impactful. Municipal government has the ability to proact and react to the many global and local challenges. You think of them, climate change, air quality, our carbon footprint, increasing obesity rates in the population at large, but in particular our children, peak oil or energy scarcity, an increasing senior population, an increasing population period. The world is projected to increase from 7 billion to 9 billion in the next 40 years. What impact will that have on us? The greater Golden Horseshoe area is expected to grow by 2.5 million people in the next 20 years. And 2.5 million people, that's approximately the size of Toronto. So we have as many people living in Toronto moving to the area in the next 20 years. Halton, Halton Region will increase by about 260,000 people between now and 2031, while Burlington will only increase by about 20,000. So how will these issues affect our weather, infrastructure, traffic congestion, air quality, and food supply? More importantly, how can we get ahead of these trends? The two resources that are required to proact and, and address the future are creativity and attitude. And many people think in business you need money to make money, but money does not make money, ideas make money. The same holds true in the municipal sector. It is not how much money we have to work with, it's what we do with it. So our speaker tonight is a pretty special guy. He, um, he's an internationally renowned livable city advisor and social marketing, marketing strategist who is passionate about vibrant and healthy communities. Hoping to improve the quality of life for all residents, Gill promotes walking and cycling, as well as the creation and use of great city parks and trails. He is the executive director of an organization called 880 Cities, and the former commissioner of parks and sports and recreation for Bogota, Colombia. He also works as a senior consultant for the Danish firm uh, Gale Architects, I hope I pronounced that right, and serves on the board of directors of American Trails, Cyclovias of, of, of the Americas, and the City Parks Alliance. Because of his unique blend of pragmatism and passion, Gil's leadership and advice has been sought out by many cities and organizations, including, including the city of Burlington. In fact, he did some work in September, Gil, was it, or early October? It was right in the middle of the election campaign, so it sort of got missed, I think. Um, so we're glad to have you back tonight. But he's presented over 150 workshops and seminars in North America. He has been a keynote speaker and provided consultation throughout North and South America, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. Please help me welcome Gil Penalosa. great to be here and I love the idea of inspiring Burlington. I hope that I'm able to inspire you in some way. And as uh, Mayor Baldwin was saying, you know, cities do change. You know, this morning I came from Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, about 30 years ago, had over 700,000 people. And actually it had a, a lot of steel mills. Now the only thing related to steel mills that it has are the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> and actually even the Pittsburgh Steelers now, they not only play football, but they also dance with the stars. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the star who actually won, won the, the last contest. But you know, now, from 700,000, 
they went to about 350,000 today. So can you imagine how things happen? So this is not theory, this is reality. Cities like Mississauga, 30 years ago, Mississauga had 200,000 people. Today it has 750,000. And it's up to each one to judge if it went right or wrong or whatever, but, 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 but it's a reality. So all of these things that are happening are challenges, but are also wonderful opportunities. And actually, uh, someone was saying, oh, you know, Gail, uh, you, are, you know that we get winter, and it's cold, uh, and in the summer it's hot and humid, that's why we don't walk or bike. And then I said, you know, that reminded me, it reminds me of the time that I was in Cuba, in January of last year, working for the Canadian government, and people said, oh, you know, we cannot walk because it's too hot. <laughs> or bike. And then I got on a plane, and I came back to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, more than anything, it's an excuse. You know, we're going to run at 26 degrees, we dress up one way. We're going to do it at minus 26, we dress up in another. So, like, I, we, we do a lot of work with Gale Architects in Denmark, and one of the things that the Danish people say, there's no such thing as bad weather. It's just bad clothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, if we dress properly, you know, we can do things any time of the year, anywhere, and then we continue and we go on. So, it's about change. And that's one of the things that unites us here is change and how to approach change. And actually, I was very optimistic about change. And I saw, you know, in Calgary, they are plowing the trails on their bikes. And now also they're getting more efficiency. In Saskatchewan, they're still using their non motorized plower. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, a couple of, a few weeks ago, actually, I was doing some work in Brazil. And, and I went in the internet and I saw the Toronto Star, the top toys for the summer. So I said, wow, well, you know, let's see what it is. Maybe, you know, it's a skateboard, maybe it's a, so, some kind of bicycle, some uh, <coughs> motorcycle or something. And then it said, who says the boys should have all the mini car fun? The top toys for the summer. Oh. You know, can you imagine? You know, in 2011, this being the top toy for the summer. So if it's not the boys, now it's the four-year-old twins, Isabella and Gabrielle. So actually, that, you know, I was in Florianopolis in Brazil, and I looked at the window, and I thought that I was in paradise. You know, the ocean, the countries, and whatever. And then I opened my eyes a little bit wider, and then I realized it, it was like almost hell. Can you imagine God being so generous and giving them such a wonderful island with palm trees, and, and they put 12 lane highway next to the beach? Can you imagine? It's, I, I was asking them, you know, and they said, I was talking in a room to like a thousand people, and I said, you know, what would happen if at least you would have done, instead of having these like 10 meters of pedestrians and cyclists, you would have taken and maybe make it a 40 meter promenade, you know, and people stood up and applied in, in here and there. That's, this, this is not what people want. This is much more what people wanted. And you know, and they live out of tourism, economic development. So what's going to bring more people, these kind of highways, or if we create these 40 meter promenades? So these are some of the things, you know. It's very clearly that, you know, we have learned to survive, but now we're going to learn to live. You know, in millions of years, after millions of years, in 1850, the expected life, the, the, the expected, uh, life uh, in Canada was 39 years. Okay. After millions, in 1850. In the last 150 years, we have gone from 39 to 82. So we have more than double in 150 years. So it's very obvious that we have learned to survive. But also it's obvious that we have to learn to live in many, many ways, you know? And one of the things that happens with the economic, when, when the economy goes well, many things improve. You know, the public health and education and the entertainment. But there is one thing that doesn't improve and is mobility when it is based on the private car. You know, and unfortunately I was in Brazil and you know, many of the developing countries, they try to you imitate the progress of the development. And you know, Los Angeles, you know, Los Angeles in the 1950s, they, their highways were four lanes, and then they went to six, and they were four, they went to eight, and they went to 10. I'm an MBA from UCLA, so I know it pretty well. And when I went there, the, the highways were 10 lanes, they went to 12 to 14, and it hasn't solved the issue of congestion in LA, you know? And actually, last year they approved by referendum a new tax. You can imagine in the middle of an economic crisis, and people approve a new tax in, refer in a referendum as long as it goes to public transit. 
Because they realize that they cannot go anymore from 14 lanes to what, 16, 18, how, how many? You know, so this is one of the things that we got to start. Is, is, are these the kind of cities that we want to have? You know, and now this is what other countries are imitating. And when we start thinking about global warming, and we start thinking about all of these public health issues all over the world, then we start thinking, you know, how are we going to live, you know? Uh, about three weeks ago, I was in a city in Latin America. We were making a TED Talks program. And so we said, oh, no, you know, we have, the economy is doing so well. Now we're really booming. And the only problem is that mobility is not very good. And then a few minutes later, that person said, you know, this year we're going to have 150,000 new cars coming into the city. The economy is going really well. Everybody. I said, I don't know, can you make a link? If you got 150,000 new cars coming into the city, and of course, in the GTA, multiply that like by five. But anyway, those 150,000 cars, let's say that when they are parked, they need about 10 meters. So it is 1.5 million meters. That's 1,500 kilometers. So if the city is developing the city, builds 1,500 kilometers, in one year, they just won't get any worse. They won't get any better, but they won't, if the cars are parked. If the cars are moving, they don't need 10 meters, maybe they need 30 meters each. So they're gonna need 2,500 meters. Then I go from Miami to New York, back to Miami and back to New York. And that is a city that has so many issues. So, so we gotta start thinking, is this the way we wanna develop? Instead, you know, the reality is, you know, we've been building cities for over 5,000 years. And it's been only in the last 40 or 60 that we have been really thinking more on car mobility than on people's habits. And not one city in the world, the size of the GTA, has solved the issue of mobility with a private car. No. So if that was an option, we would have 100 or 200 examples to, to show. We don't have any. The reality is that we're going to have public transit. And one of the nice things about public transit is that you can also improve you know, the sidewalks and the facades and the public realm and take advantage of a, a little bit of this money. And of course, you know, some people say, oh, no, we want to go underground. You know, in a, in a city <coughs> story in Toronto, now they want to go underground. You know, underground, the only people that really like to go underground are not the only people. Are the rats. <laughs> if you could go at the same speed, people would much rather go above ground. And also for the economy, it's much better to go above ground. Because when you're going underground, you go underground in one station, then you move underground and you come up to the other station. So you don't see anything in between. When you're going above ground, all of a sudden you see everything. Oh, there's a new shoe store. There is a new, they, they have a sale in the flower shop. You know, they got, and also, you know, if public transit is good for the environment, it's good for public health, it's good for society, why is it that we are going to have the people that use public transit go on the ground and not be able to see the trees and the sun and the people and the stores and all of these things? So all of this has a lot to do with quality of life. So there's a lot of decisions that, that, that are involved. And why am I telling you about this, although you're in Burlington? Because you are paying part of it. You know, in Toronto, for example, in the last, not, not this administration, we can talk about it later on, in the past, a new subway is being built eight kilometers in the barn, because the subway is heading to barn. And all of us, we are paying two thirds of it, because one third of it is federal government, so all of you are paying part of it. One third is provincial government, so also all of you are part of it. And one third is the city. $2.6 billion to do eight kilometers in bond that is not going to solve anything. It could, have been, it could easily have been sold with a, with a bus rapid transit uh, with 10% of the cost. But we would have the other 90% to do so many other things. So let's start thinking about some of these issues. You know, someone said, when, what I compare bike lanes to is swimming with the sharks. Sooner or later, you'll get bitten. I guess you already guessed who said it, but anyway, he said, roads are built for buses, cars, and trucks, not for people on bikes. You know, the reality is that in the 1890s, can you imagine in the 1800, 1800s, there was no TV, much less no internet, no nothing, and they had over 100 members, were members of the American women. Can you imagine? Over 100,000. So it's like now having over a million people. Now you, you just subscribe through the internet and you send your credit card or whatever. So, and actually the first roads that were paid in North America were paid because the American women put the pressure. And so they were working on how to improve the roads and how to pull pavement and how to do the work. And actually that's how the American Automobile Association was created. And you know the kids used to play on the streets at the time, so, it, so it's not that the streets 
were built for cars. So in the 1890s, this wonderful American Women Association, afterwards split into two. One in the League of American Cyclists, and the other part went to the AAA, the American Automobile Association. So we gotta think about this thing, and he said, my heart bleeds when someone gets killed, but it's their own fault at the end of the day. I guess his heart is bleeding a lot, because, you know, last year, one pedestrian was hit by a car every three hours and 50 minutes in Toronto. Not in the GTA, just in the municipality of Toronto. And it's probably much more, because that is what is reported to the police. And many of them, if you're not really injured badly, you're not reported to the police because it's too much hassle. You know, and one cyclist every seven hours. So the reality is that we gotta change. But nevertheless, I was invited more to inspire, so not to talk about sad things. And one of the things that the cars have that are really nice is a very small rear view mirror and a very big windshield. So that we can focus more in the present and the future and not so much in the past. And actually, you know, a nice sign. A few weeks ago, I was invited to do a keynote in Vancouver by the Canadian Automobile Association. You know, they, they are showing an open mind. They did a survey among the members. There are over 5 million members in Canada, and 60% of them said that they would like to ride a bike if they were protected by it, if they were safe places, in the, in the good, in the most of the good world. 60% of the members. That's what they invited me. Initially, when I got the invitation, I said, oh, maybe, you know, there, someone is playing a joke with me. <laughs> no, they were very open-minded, excellent, wonderful meeting. Very lively, and actually they put it on the internet, and they did a simulcast with all of the offices across Canada. And it's a their magazine, their spring magazine. You know, one it has a woman, two riding bicycle, three is is a city bike. So all of this is really great. And actually, you know, the other one, this I took this photo on the trail, on the waterfront trail here in Berlin. I saw this, and this kid little kid was riding with his dad, and I said, "Oh, can I take a photo of your kid?" I think that is the attitude, you know, the children are fantastic, that's why whenever we go and do work, whether it's Australia or whatever, whether it's Australia or anywhere else, uh, the people on the sound, don't be shy, tell me. Uh, we try to talk to children because, you know, they're very open. They don't have so much baggage, you know. When we were that little, for example, you know, the winter clothing was heavy and bulky and expensive, and we thought we looked like the Michelin men, so we wouldn't go out. But now these kids, they go everywhere. So, for example, we ask these kids, why don't you draw, how would you like your community to be when you are your parents' age and you have kids of your own age? And they started doing drawings, and look at this, for example. Anna, half of, uh, half of it is, is a park, green spaces. Edgar, Edgar is only 13, but he drew places that were there fewer cars, and then he wrote many people walking and many people cycling. And then Edgar drew an area for pedestrians, for cyclists, for buses, and for cars. You know? He's only 13, but he knows that if we mix pedestrians and cyclists, the pedestrian gets injured. It will be cyclists and cars. The cyclist is gonna get injured. So each one needs their own separate space. And then Edgar drew public parks, and then he drew some buildings, low buildings with street level activity. You know, in November, I was working in Seoul, Korea with the National University and the PhD students, and they're very, very smart. And I said, hey, I hope that you study very hard because now the 13 year olds can summarize urban planning in 101 in one drawing. The reality is that we had communities like this, we would have pretty good communities. So when people say it's not rocket science, uh, no, maybe it's not. I'm not saying it's rocket science. Maybe rocket science is to get it done. And I'm really happy to be here in Burlington. I've been in Burlington many, many times. I used to play in a soccer team that we play many games here. My children also played many times in Burlington. Uh, with 880 cities, we have done work twice in Burlington. Last year in the middle of the election on walkable areas in the downtown. At another time in the Appleby GO station, how to, uh, to, how to provide ideas to GO transit on how to improve the, the station and so on. So I, I, I know Burlington pretty well. And I think that, you know, God has been so generous with you that you gotta give back. You have a beautiful waterfront. You got the escarpment. You got all of these creeks going up and down. So really, 80% uh, of the work is already done. So now you gotta do the other 20. Uh, and of course, some of the things that man, or man and women, people have made are terrible, such as the QEW. The QEW is terrible. How is split all of this, Mississauga, Oakville, Burlington, in two? 
north of the QE, south of the QE. For example, one of the things that was terrible is how in the, in, in, in the last couple of years, the QE has been widened. And you know, they could have done 20 pedestrian bridges across the QE. And for peanuts, for maybe 2% of the, of the budget of the project, it would have been nothing. People would not have even noticed. I mean, if you try to get 20 or 30 million to do pedestrian bridges, it's a huge discussion. But if you got a project that is 800 million or 1 billion, and you say, you know, let's put 20 million more for pedestrian bridges, no one even noticed it. But then we we'll start thinking about the pedestrians. When else are we going to get the budget? And that's really, really unfortunate. At that time, the Minister of Transportation at the provincial level couldn't care less about the pedestrians. Thank God now we got a woman that actually, he's not, she's not a transportation engineer, she's, she's an expert in education. Actually, she, re, she didn't know much about transportation when she was appointed Minister of Transportation. But she's very smart, and, she knew, and now she always talks about pedestrians and cyclists, and I'm sure that maybe a lot of better things are gonna come through it. But we gotta take opportunity of each, of each one of those triggers. You know, each one of those opportunities should be so that we can do something with it. And that, that is something that is, that is also wonderful. For example, it's really nice to be here uh, in Burlington, but at this university, can you imagine if this site had been built downtown, right in the heart of downtown? Oh my God. What a waste, with all due respect to the university, but what a waste to have built it in this horrible place. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not politically correct. I love Canada. I became Canadian. I have now dual citizenship. But one of the things that I'm not is politically correct. Because I believe that we should not be politically correct. We should be able to be, have a dialogue and say whatever we think. But the reality is that most places around the world, whatever you build next to the rail lines or next to the highways are warehouses and factories. I mean, if you want to know what you build next to the highway, all you have to do is to take a look at all of, all of the neighbors of this university. There is no life. Who's going to benefit from this one? No one. People are just going to drive in, go to class, and drive out. The benefit for Burlington is going to be nothing. If this had been done, can you imagine for a second, Brantford, around the world, Brantford, you know, their downtown, their main street of Brantford was going broke all of the stores. So they said, we need a university. So they did the same thing. They, went, they couldn't get a university, so they went to Wil Wilfred Laurier. And they got Wilfrid Laurier to open a small campus on a trial basis, 500 students. Well, that was six years ago. Now they got over 5,000 students on the main street of Brantford. Can you imagine what 5,000 students buying coffees and hot dogs and hamburgers and renting rooms to stay and books and, and also working and clothing and so on? The vibrancy that it has brought to Brantford, all of a sudden, the main street is totally revived. The whole Brantford is totally different. And also, it's a wonderful fit with tourism because the students are there from September through April, and then the tourists are from May through August. So it's a great fit. You know, and by the way, you know, this, this is a public university, so it's public funds. So with the public funds, we should do better use of some of these things. So, so this is just as a, I just couldn't, I, I had to get it out of my system. <laughs> Sorry for McMaster, and I love McMaster, and I think he has many, many good things, but I'm sure the MBA students would, would much rather enjoy going out and walking around and getting some flowers for their girlfriend and then having a coffee and then walking out. And it would be much better also for the economy of Burlington. But why, do, why are we called 880 cities, people say? You know, 880 cities, some people say, is it because he's walking or cycling in public places? Yeah, but those are the means, not the ends. The ends is how can we get vibrant cities with healthy communities where people are going to live happier, enjoying their public places. So the reality also is when we do work, whether we are doing a capacity building or place making that we call it recreating places, people ask, is this intersection safe? Can I send my kids cycling to school? Can my grandparents go, go to the park? And I said, look, you, know, it's a, you don't have to be a PhD in engineering. All you really need is common sense, which is sometimes the least common of the senses. But rule number one, step number one, think of an eight-year-old that you really love, your son or daughter or nephew. Once you have that boy or girl in your mind, step number two, think of an older adult that you also are affectionate. And when you have the child and the older adult in mind, step number three, would you send them on that intersection? Would you send them to get eggs or milk or to go to school or to go to the park? If you would, it's because it's safe enough. If you would not, it's because it's not. 
and we got to do it better. You know, what if everything that we did in Burlington's public places, the rule of thumb is that it had to be fantastic for the 8 and the 80 year olds. We would probably end up with good communities for everybody. You know, we have to stop building communities thinking that everybody's 30 year old and athletic. And we got to start building communities that are good for everybody. Everybody. You know, we, we keep saying, oh, the baby boomers and the aging and all of this, and, and, and we are not doing anything about it. It's such a wonderful opportunity that Burlington has to lead the world. And, and by the way, why do I say Burlington has? Because you also have, in addition of all the wonderful things that God has given you, Burlington is one of the cities with the highest level of education in Canada. It's also one of the cities with the highest per capita income in Canada. So at the same time, this brings a an opportunity, but also kind of like a responsibility to lead the way. You know, tomorrow I'm going to Vancouver. In Vancouver, they decided that they want to be the most sustainable city in the world by 2020. The most sustainable. So I said, okay, what is Burlington going to be in 2020? You know, it cannot be just a little bit more efficient. It cannot be just doing... I'm sure that the mayor and the councillors didn't want to be elected just to do a little bit more of the same, but a little bit better done, a little bit more efficient. No, I, I think it would be an opportunity to be transformational. You know, how about if it was going to be the healthiest city in the world? At least the healthiest city, not in Ontario, in Canada. You know, let me give you a challenge. The other day I was in Mississauga, and I had all of the directors and the commissioners were sitting in the audience. And I said, look, over the last 30 years, you have built hundreds of kilometers of roads, of sidewalks, dozens of schools, of libraries, whatever. I said, can you, and I said, you know, I came, I was, the day before I had come from Guadalajara, uh, where, where I was with the people that transformed Barcelona. And I said, the people who transformed Barcelona, I said, here you got the mayor of Guadalajara and the governor, any recommendation? And they said, yeah, one. Anything that you do in the public space, make sure that you generate the envy of every city in Mexico. So then I was asking the people in, in, in Mississauga, I said, look, of all of these dozens of schools and libraries and whatever, does any of them generate the envy?